I'm Joshua Roberts, attorney at law, and you are watching Lawyer Up. In this episode, we're going to be talking about money laundering. We're going to define what it is, and we're going to look at the various methods and how they have changed in response to legislation over the years in the United States. As always, if you learned something today, hit that like button. If you want to know more about the law, subscribe to the channel. If you have something to say, comment below. And as always, share me on social media if you have friends that you think might enjoy the channel. Now, when we talk about money laundering, the first thing we need to do is just define the terms. Uh, money, it's pretty simple. That's either banknotes or coins. I mean, it's just currency. You know what money is. And laundering, well, that's just to clean something. Uh, for example, if I get this shirt dirty, I'll take it into the laundry and it will be laundered. It goes in dirty and it comes out clean. That's laundering. Now, money laundering in a legal sense is taking money that has been obtained by an illegal means and putting it through a process so that it appears to have been obtained by a legal method. So you're taking dirty money and you're making it clean. Now, money laundering is, of course, illegal now in the United States and internationally, but it hasn't always been. As you will learn today, there has been a long history of money laundering and legislative responses uh, to that type of behavior, but it wasn't until 1986 that officially money laundering became a crime federally in the United States. Now, the first thing I want to get out of the way is people ask, well, is money laundering just putting money in the washing machine? Well, uh, yes and no. When I talk about money laundering, I'm talking about the concept of taking dirty money and making it clean. Now, one of the ways that uh, criminals uh, do that is by actually putting bills into the washing machine. Uh, they go through the wash process and dry, and it gives those bills the appearance of having been uh, used. They have been in the uh, American marketplace, and so it's not a stack of crisp uh, $100 bills. It's something that looks used, and in a way uh, that is literally laundering money and also part of the overall money laundering scheme. However, when I talk about money laundering, I'm not talking about literally putting it in the washing machine, okay? The question is, who does this? And the answer is quite simple. Uh, it's criminals. Uh, it's popular in drug trafficking, uh, prostitution rings, illegal gambling houses with organized crime who engage in you know, extortion or just outright theft. Money laundering can be relative to any illegal activity. And the methods by which a criminal can launder money is really innumerable. Criminals are only limited by their own ingenuity in thinking up new ways to launder illegally obtained money. So as we talk about the history of money laundering, we're going to use a lot of the different methods that uh, criminals employ to actually launder the money. As I mentioned, the federal law against money laundering has only been in existence since 1986. And this is what it says. It is illegal to conceal or disguise the source, control, or ownership of money that has been made from unlawful activities. That is, illegal activities, or it is the act of avoiding a transaction reporting requirement. Now that's structuring, and we'll talk about that a little later. So when we're talking about federal money laundering, we're talking about trying to disguise or conceal uh, proceeds from an illegal activity. We're also talking about taking steps to structure transactions to avoid certain governmental reporting requirements. This is an offense that carries from zero to 20 years in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. You can also be fined either up to $500,000 and or twice the amount of the money laundered, whichever is larger. You also forfeit any money that was laundered, so you can't use that to pay the fines, unfortunately. Now, as an attorney over the years, I've handled probably a, a dozen cases that involve money laundering, and they've all been at the federal level, and usually the prosecution focuses on whatever the underlying activity is that generated the money. So it's a drug trafficking ring or some other illegal activity that is the focus of the prosecution. However, interestingly, 
the proof of the money laundering components actually helps prove the underlying crime. Sometimes the actual proof of the criminal activity uh, is hard to come by, but the money laundering is clear and it can actually prove the conspiracy to engage in whatever the criminal conduct is that is the subject matter of the case. As I mentioned before, the means by which people launder money is very diverse, but the methodology is generally the same. And this is how it's labeled in the literature. It's a three-step process that involves placement, layering, and integration. And I'll go through each of those steps in more detail. The idea of placement is when you introduce illegal cash or money obtained from an illegal activity into a legal system. So when you're placing the money, you are taking uh, dirty money and placing it into a legitimate financial transaction system. The second concept is layering, and that's where uh, legally sourced money is basically layered or entwined with the illegal funds that have been placed in the system. And finally, integration, that is where the dirty money and the clean money have been so combined uh, that it all appears clean and it can be integrated or used in the regular uh, monetary system and used for any purpose. And to illustrate this, we will use an example from a popular television show. Uh, Netflix series Ozark is all about money laundering. The lead character, Marty Bird, is an accountant who launders money for a Mexican drug cartel. That's what the show is about, laundering money. And at a point in time in the show, uh, Marty Bird owns a casino and he launders money through that casino. And what he does in one instance is he takes the cash boxes. These are the boxes that are either installed in slot machines or used by the dealers uh, when they're dealing the games out on the floor and this is just the money that the cash goes into. Well ordinarily at the beginning of the day these boxes start empty. They go out onto the floor, they're filled with cash from gambling proceeds and then they're brought back into the cash room to be counted. Well in the episode of Ozark where Marty uh, launders money he actually takes drug money at the beginning of the day and he puts it in all of these cash boxes. So instead of starting empty, they start off with five or six grand in them. That is the placement of the illegal funds. And these boxes are all locked, so nobody knows uh, how much money is in the boxes when they start the day, other than people that are in on the conspiracy to launder the money. So those boxes are then placed on the casino floors, and as people gamble throughout the day, additional clean money is added to the drug money that was initially placed into the boxes. This is the layering. Finally, at the end of the day, these boxes are collected and taken to the cash room or the counting room, uh, and the totals are tabulated uh, without the person counting knowing that there was actually at the beginning of the day several thousand dollars that was placed in each box. At the end of the day they have a total amount of money they made presumably from all legal gambling and that is the integration of that money into the legitimate business systems of that particular organization. Ozark provides many examples of how to launder money. That's just one of them. Now let's talk about the history of money laundering in the United States. Money laundering rose to prominence in the United States during the prohibition era of the 20s and 30s. It was during this time where the sale or even consumption of alcohol was illegal nationwide. Well, that didn't stop anybody, really. There were speakeasies, as they were called, these underground bars that popped up all over the United States. And it was in these uh, clubs where you could have access to, to alcohol. Uh, they also specialized in prostitution. There was illegal gambling and other various and sundry activities uh, that were engaged in these speakeasies. Most of these speakeasies were supplied with their alcohol and or operated by organized crime outfits. In fact, the popularity of the prohibition era speakeasies is really what popularized organized crime in the United States during this time period. And if you know your history, you know Al Capone. This is where he became famous with his organized crime syndicate based out of Chicago. And if you know the story about Scarface, uh, Mr. Capone had several fronts or businesses uh, upon which he laundered money. 
but ultimately what's interesting is Al Capone, he didn't go to prison for the criminal activities he was engaged in. Uh, he didn't go to prison for supplying alcohol to speakeasies. He didn't go to prison for organizing the murder of other rival gang members. He went to prison for tax evasion. And of course, this sent a ripple through the criminal world. He's like, we can get away with the criminal activity, we can get away with laundering money, but we better pay taxes once we have laundered the money and it appears to be legitimate. If we don't pay taxes on it, we're gonna wind up like Mr. Capone and we're gonna be in the clink. So over the next 30 years, organized crime continued to grow, money laundering continued to grow, but these guys had figured out that we better be paying taxes on any of this money that we launder and then declare legitimate for business purposes. And they did this through lots of the traditional means of businesses that launder money. And we're talking about restaurants, bars, casinos. Uh, but what did start to emerge was a trend where these guys used banks. That's right, they used banks. And you'd say, well, how do they use banks? You can't just buy a bank. Well, actually you can if you have enough money. And that's what the large organized crime outfits did. They would simply buy a bank from which to launder money. And this actually became a big enough problem in the United States where they had uh, dirty banks that in 1970, the federal government passed the Bank Secrecy Act. And it's exactly the opposite of what it sounds like. It sounds like it would be in favor of bank secrecy but it was not, it was quite the opposite. So in 1970 with the Bank Secrecy Act, it forever changed the landscape of money laundering in the United States because it implemented two big changes. The first of which was know your customer laws. And we'll talk about uh, what that means. The second one was CTRs or currency transaction reports. Now that's not what they were called at the time back in 1970, but that's what they're known as today. And these deal with large uh, deposits or withdrawals that must be reported to the government. So let's talk about know your customer laws. Essentially, this is a law that requires banks to do due diligence to discover really the true identity of their customer. A bank needs to identify the customer. And if it's an individual, this, they need to know their name, their address, their social security number, stuff like that. Uh, if it's a business or a corporate account, they need to know who the owners are, uh, the business's uh, corporate documents they'll need to have. They'll need to have a federal uh, employer identification number or the corporate tax ID number on file. And basically know the true identity of who your customer is. Banks were also responsible for knowing the customer's normal banking habits. Now, of course, this is kind of impossible for humans to do. So banks developed software to essentially flag management if there was uh, some sort of a transaction that was out of the normal. Uh, for example, if a customer is uh, Farmer Bob and Farmer Bob has been depositing $500 a week every week for the past four years, and then he comes in on Friday and deposits $19,000, that is going to be flagged by the system as outside of the scope of the normal banking activities of Farmer Bob. Now this may not be money laundering at all. Maybe he sold a tractor. However, somebody in banking management is gonna look into that transaction uh, and they're required to under the uh, know your customer laws of the federal government. Banks are also required to maintain banking records for a certain period of time in case uh, somebody comes in to investigate, they can give uh, the authorities evidence of withdrawals and um, deposits. And banks are also required to report any type of suspicious activities and or large transactions. That brings us to the second big change under the Bank Secrecy Act, and that was the CTRs. Uh, they're called Currency Transaction Reports, or some people call them Cash Transaction Reports because they're generated by a large cash uh, deposit or withdrawal. Now that's not what they were originally called back in 1970, but today we have all banks or all financial institutions that are required to file a CTR report if there is any deposit or withdrawal in excess of $10,000 that involves cash. In these CTR reports, they have to identify the customer or who was involved, the amount of the cash transaction, and if anything suspicious is going on. 
Now these reports are generated automatically by bank software these days, and there's a little bitty box on them that a teller can check. It's called the SAR box. That is the Suspicious Activity Report box. Now, when these CTRs are submitted to the government, they're gonna be looked at by uh, somebody. But when the SAR box is checked, they're gonna be investigated. And they are investigated by the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network of the Department of the Treasury. FinCEN is what they're called. So it didn't take long for criminals to realize that if we deposit or withdraw more than $10,000 in cash, there's going to be a CTR filed. Somebody's gonna be notified of what we have done. So they decided, well, I know what we'll do. We will just structure our transactions so that they never get above $10,000. I'll just have a series of $9,900 deposits and withdrawals, and we completely avoid the $10,000 reporting requirement. Well, go back to my definition of money laundering that I gave you in the beginning. It was number one, taking dirty money and doing something to disguise the true nature of it and making it appear as though it were clean. Or, and this is part two, it is avoiding federal reporting requirements regarding the transaction. And that's where we get into the structuring as part of money laundering. When criminals structure their transactions in a way to avoid the $10,000 CTR requirement, that is also against the law and also considered money laundering. And interestingly, this $10,000 uh, deposit or withdrawal it uh, is over a 24 hour period. So if you make a series of $500 deposits that total in 24 hours over $10,000, that will also trigger a CTR to the federal government. Now, one of the interesting responses by the criminal community uh, to the Bank Secrecy Act of 1970 uh, was to say, well, hmm, we can't do this as freely as we had before uh, with the banks uh, that we owned in the United States. So maybe we should look elsewhere. And they did. After the Bank Secrecy Act, the popularity of offshore or overseas bank accounts grew within the organized crime community. Banks in Switzerland, for example, or Grand Cayman, they specialized in customer privacy. So organized crime outfits in the United States would simply set up bank accounts uh, overseas. And because of these uh, bank uh, customer privacy uh, requirements that these banks had, Really, all you needed was an account number, a routing number, and an additional owner number, and you could do anything you wanted with those accounts. Those banks weren't really interested in uh, your true identity, and you could easily transfer money from the United States to an offshore account and back. And that's what a lot of the organized crime uh, criminals were doing. They were returning money back from an offshore account and basically claiming it as legitimate funds that they had earned from a foreign investment. It's like, oh yeah, I invested some money over there in Switzerland. We had a nice uh, profit and this is profit from a legitimate business. So the process of simply transferring money offshore and back was how organized criminals laundered money uh, in the 80s. Remember at this point in time, there was no actual law against laundering money. That didn't come until 1986. So criminals fairly easily could avoid the Bank Secrecy Act requirements by having their banking be offshore. Then came the 1980s War on Drugs and various laws were passed to officially criminalize money laundering. In addition to criminalizing the act of money laundering, now law enforcement was able to seize and keep some of the proceeds of these illegal activities. This obviously was a great way for federal entities and drug task force to self-fund by taking money that they were able to get from criminals and use it for legitimate purposes of funding their uh, law enforcement agency or organization. And even though the uh, war on drugs was raging and money laundering was now illegal, there still was a substantial amount of offshore bank account usage and utilization from criminal enterprises. Well, at least until 9-11. After September 11th of 2001, the legislature passed Title III of the Patriot Act. This was a direct result of the government determining that the 9-11 terrorist attacks were funded by international money laundering. 
And really, this is when the United States and the world, for that matter, got really serious about cracking down on money laundering. There was the creation of the International Financial Task Force, which was an organization with its sole purpose to monitor and investigate international or global wire transfers and money laundering. And this organization was specifically tasked with trying to police the international transfer of funds that was being used to finance international terrorism. And it was at this point that even many of the nations that considered bank uh, customer privacy as king, they realized that they actually did need to engage in some due diligence uh, as to who their customer was because they didn't want to be involved in obviously international terrorism financing. So as these laws began to spread internationally, the offshore bank account uh, situation kind of lost its luster uh, with organized criminals in the United States. In fact, with the Patriot Act, large transfers in excess of $10,000 would often be flagged and held uh, while the source and the destination were investigated, sometimes for several months. Needless to say, this was unacceptable to organized criminals and so uh, money laundering kind of came home in the 2000s. And since that time, money laundering has primarily existed in the United States in what they call business fronts or legitimate businesses uh, where illegal funds are kind of uh, integrated or layered into the system uh, to launder the money for these criminal enterprises. And cash intensive businesses are best where you can throw in dirty money with clean money and mix it all together and claim it all as legitimate proceeds. Most common of these types of businesses that are used for money laundering are strip clubs, uh, restaurants, bars, casinos, hotels. Newer businesses um, that have also uh, been involved in money laundering in recent history are tanning salons, car washes, arcades, even parking garages or parking lots have been utilized by organized crime to launder money. As an attorney, I've seen multiple cases where used car lots were used to launder money. Now, the more sophisticated criminal will tell you to use a service business, not an inventory or a good-based business because it's much easier to track uh, how many cars you're selling, for example, as opposed to how many people have participated uh, or gone through your service business or been to your bar or through your tanning parlor, for that matter. And it just kind of makes common sense that these service-based businesses make it much more difficult for the authorities to prove money laundering. Now let's talk about a couple of examples from uh, television shows that have been popular over the years. Now we'll start with Breaking Bad. You may recall that show about a high school chemistry teacher who goes uh, rogue and starts making methamphetamine. Uh, there were several entities that laundered money in uh, Breaking Bad, starting with Gus Fring. If you remember that particular character, uh, he laundered his drug money through Los Polos Hermanos, a chicken outfit in uh, the Southwest, primarily in New Mexico. Also, Walter White himself, uh, he and his wife bought a car wash to launder money um, from profits of his uh, production of methamphetamine. If you switch gears to the television show on Netflix, Ozark, uh, the lead character Marty Bird in that show is tasked with laundering money. That's what the entire show is about. And if you're familiar with that show, he begins by buying a strip club. And then he buys a lake resort that contains a bar and a restaurant and a hotel. And ultimately, he upgrades his money laundering to an actual casino. All of these are fairly common ways that criminals use to launder money. So as you've probably gathered by now, there are limitless ways to launder money. But one thing is in common. If you do it, you'll wind up in prison because eventually you will get caught. And somebody did ask me, what type of money laundering do I see most? And that is the, I call it the casino winnings scheme, where a individual, and usually it's somebody who's made a drug sale, uh, will take their money, five, six, seven thousand dollars into a casino, and they'll buy chips or they'll play games uh, for a short period of time, and then they'll cash out. Now, when you cash out, you're either gonna get a check from the casino, or they're gonna give you money and a receipt. Either way, you can say, hey, 
This is legitimate money. It's gambling winnings. So that is the scheme that I see uh, most often uh, in my uh, profession as an attorney. And where a lot of people get caught in these schemes with the casinos is that they don't realize that casinos are also financial institutions that are subject to the CTR requirement. If you win or lose more than $10,000 or transact and deposit that amount of money, they have to file a CTR just like everybody else. Interestingly, the newest form of money laundering is the art market. Uh, and when you think about it, it's probably one of the best suited for money laundering because who is to say what a painting is worth? You can say, yeah, I sold a painting. I, uh, it was worth $30,000. He paid me $30,000 for my painting. And, you know, it's subjective. Who's to say it's not worth $30,000? Also, art is not titled uh, like a lot of things, like a car or something. Uh, you don't even have to know who bought it. You could say, yeah, I sold it to Jeff for $30,000. No, I don't remember his last name. I don't know where he was from. And it creates an interesting challenge for law enforcement to try to prove uh, money laundering in the art world. Another new area is this cryptocurrency. Zcash or Monero or Bitcoin you've probably heard of. A lot of the ownership of Bitcoin is completely anonymous. It's related to a series of numbers and not linked to any particular customer. So it is a wonderful way for organized crime to launder money. And another new way people are laundering money and it's uh, almost comical is through online gaming. There are games like Second Life and World of Warcraft where you can buy things in the game with actual money. And you can also cash those things out for money. And it has provided, in some instances, ways for uh, small-scale organized crime, anyway, to launder money through the internet. So the question is, when will the government strike back and require the uh, art industry and or the online gaming industry to uh, enact uh, know your customer laws? Who knows? We'll see what happens. One thing is for sure is that the internet really complicates law enforcement uh, in trying to unravel money laundering schemes that are done through the internet. Now, some of the big boys like PayPal and Venmo, they are playing by the rules and they are transparent. But there's always gonna be organizations out there that are willing to bend the rules and allow money launderers to take advantage of their services. Well, that's it. That's the episode on money laundering. We have talked about what it is. We've talked about the history of money laundering and a lot of different examples of how criminals have laundered money uh, over the years. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, hit that like button. If you wanna see more interesting legal topics, then subscribe to the channel. If you got something to say, comment below. And as always, Share me on social media. Thanks for watching. I'm Joshua Roberts, and this is Lawyer Up. Send lawyers, guns, and money. Dad, get me out of this.